all these de developers that are developing affordable housing, they're not only thinking about providing, you know, the adequate housing and dignified housing, but they're also trying to provide tools to be able, for the residents to be able to move through that wrong mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to get that education, which I, to me is, is as important as providing the housing itself. <music> Welcome to the Small Nation Podcast, brought to you by CoverLink Insurance, where people are more important than policies. On this show, we unpack lessons from entrepreneurs, break down development strategies, and do deep dives on small town success. Our goal is to provide value to our listeners by hosting conversations that teach, inform, and inspire. Hey, everyone. My name is Ethan DeLeon, and I'm here in the studio with the founder and CEO of Small Nation, Jason Duff. Today, we're excited to be hosting the market lead and design strategist for affordable housing at MA Design, Rolando Matias. Rolando, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited for Rolando to be here. I, I mentioned earlier when I came in the studio that I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, I was thinking back to how I first met Rolando, and you know you get those LinkedIn requests every so often <laughs> yeah. in a message. And what was meaningful about the message that I got is that he reached out with a compliment on a project that we were working on at the time and shared that he was passionate about architecture and wanted to connect. And I think that that compliment just, you know, that he had an interest in one of our projects. And then the other thing that was meaningful, when someone takes the time to do that, I'm like, I would love to connect with you. And he took the time to direct, drive up from the Dayton area to Bell Fountain and we walked around and we talked about old buildings, their history, their <laughs> stories. But when I, after that connection, I then went back to the internet and started learning a lot more about Rolando. And I was blown away. He was He's very humble, but the kinds of designs and projects that he were doing uh, were very notable in a lot of other big cities and towns and places all around the country. So... Um, really, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio today. Thank you. Likewise. And if you know anything about design and architecture, um, the firm like MA uh, really is one of those firms that's doing what I would call aspiring work mm. um, in 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 places. You know, obviously here in Ohio, but 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 far beyond. Uh, and and so I, I think you know, the topic that when we were chatting about different things to cover. About everywhere I go, everyone is trying to figure out in the crisis that we have about needing more housing units. And we've had other guests on that has highlighted, particularly in the Midwest and the Columbus region, mm -hmm. um, we are, we are, we've not been keeping up with building more housing. Right. And the other thing that is a challenge is in the, the economic realities of the situation. You know, interest rates uh, have been, you know, historically uh, records, record highs in the last at least last 20 years, and we're, we're not seeing the, the developers being motivated to, to go and build more houses. That does not remove that there's not a significant problem that we need more housing. So the topic today, and I want to bring in kind of a thought leader that we can unpack what's going on or what's happened, but then also more, what are some of the creative things that, that we can do to uh, see more housing mm -hmm. types of all, all styles be built, and, and particularly around affordable housing, how from design and how we can think about working with communities to make that better. So it's an easy problem. I'm sure you have all the answers for that today. <laughs> if it would be an easy problem, I would not be sitting in this chair today. <laughs> so um, absolutely, indeed. I think you, uh, you know, you hit it right on the, you know, the, the nail right on the head of, of what are the issues right now that we are encountering a reference to affordable housing and um, uh, how can we, how can we overcome those obstacles? How can we overcome um, the NIMBYism or, or be able to educate the people to understand uh, what is affordable housing? A lot of the people that are against affordable housing are the people that will be served by an affordable housing program. An affordable housing program, you know, as you know, by definition, affordable housing is all housing that is within 30% of your household income, okay, yes. including utilities. So... Um, how can we make this work? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of programs. There's uh, the housing and urban uh, development programs. There's uh, the low income housing tax credit programs, and all of the all of these programs. Unfortunately, when they come to a neighborhood or to a town, they have certain stigma attached to mm -hmm. it that have created uh, some difficulties for developers. 
and have created a lot of difficulties for the municipalities to be able to uh, counteract this opposition for affordable housing. So from our end, from our end at MA, particularly myself, you know, leading the affordable housing um, portion of, uh, of MA, is to be able to handle our clients no matter what level of sophistication they will have, but also, more importantly, when it comes to a developer that we would have to uh, come to a neighborhood or to a town to be able to educate the people about what affordable housing is, that we'll be able to bring in there all the different facts that we can present for the people to get educated. Now, one of the problems is that when you get to some of these town hall meetings or neighborhood association meetings is that they already come with their predetermined ideas of what affordable housing is. Mm -hmm. And one of the critical things is that, that as you know, people that are going to come to these type of meetings are not the people that are rah, rah about the project. No, they, stay <laughs> right. at, they stay at home. Right. Yeah. You know, what's the point? You know, right. I'm, I'm all for it. But it's the people that are, have certain apprehensions or totally against it. Or just don't want change. Oh, they, don't, they just don't want change. Absolutely. So all of a sudden, um, all you need is one or two people in these neighborhoods, uh, uh, association meetings or town hall meetings to be able to start bringing uh, all these false information that all of a sudden will become an issue that you have to answer to those questions and have to, you know, educate them, like I say, which you have, that's, you know, the bottom line of what you would like to, to have and be able to, to, you know, eliminate all those barriers and misnomers that, that they might have. But, you know, one of the important things is that if you go to the meeting and that people need to listen to what you're saying so they understand, hey, we're here because we is, this is a good project for your neighborhood. This is a good project for, for your municipality. This is going to resolve a lot of housing issues. It's going to be able to provide, if we're talking about, multi, let's just say we're talking about multi-residential project that's it's going to provide 100 units. So it's going to provide, you know, uh, dignified housing for 100 families that are in need mm -hmm. of that particular development. So we have a lot of people and you're speaking my language Rolando that are listening that maybe in their town they're getting ready to embark on their first project and you have shared in just that three minutes so many things that I'm I'm excited to talk about in this episode today but you know thinking at at the higher level um, what Rolando is is a design professional um, and being an architect and being working in a firm with other, designers, engineers, and creatives, as a, a developer, partnering up with someone like Rolando is really, really important because you maybe have this dream or ambition to create more housing in your community. But within a city or a community, there are laws and rules. We have ordinances, we have zoning laws, we have use, uh, the, the types of, of things that are permitted in there, and then we have occupancy. So all of those kind of different buckets require uh, regulations to Absolutely. navigate through. Yeah. And so my first project, I didn't know any of, any of these things. I just wanted to renovate an old building. And what I learned really quickly is that you can't do these things without permits and you can't do these things without the right zoning or the right use in terms of occupancy to end up with a successful project. So maybe let, let's start here because I, I want to go into talking about your advice when you are presenting in front of a board, whether it's a city council or a planning commission or a board of zoning appeals, whatever exists in your local jurisdiction, can you share a little bit about where is the first place to start? If you want to create more housing in your community, whether it's renovating an existing property or platting out um, and building something new, where do you, what do you do to start? Well, we, will be partnering with the developer. Just say that you are the developer and you say, hey, Rolando, I'm looking to develop a plot of land that be able to provide housing for 100 units, yeah. 100 families. So the first thing I would do, I would come say, hello, hey, Jason, let's go, let's go drive around the area. Let's look at what properties would be available. And then we, once we identify a property that would be adequate to develop, uh, for the right size, uh, then we have to start talking 
economics. You cannot leave economics out of the way. So understand, you know, that once you have that property, that property, once you develop it, will be able to give you the return on investment that you're looking for. And, you know, return on investment is not a dirty word. Profitability is not yeah, a dirty right. word. Because well, it when, may be go or no go. Right. You know, a developer is not going to execute a vision without understanding. And a bank's not going to lend the money. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's going to be involved. The, bo- the bank is not going to, you know, lend the money. Uh, so we have to look at that. Is this money, you know, is this property for the money? Is that viable for the vision that you have and for the particular project that we're looking for? Let's just say yes. So we continue. And, you know, all of a sudden, you and I would sit down and start talking about exactly what you need. We'll take that particular vision that you have, be able to put it on paper, start doing some sketches. Once we have some sketches and say, okay, Jason, let's go talk to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Let's see what they think about it. Let's let's understand uh, uh, what we're trying to do. Once we go to the, you know, Planning and Zoning, we'll be able to talk about, we, you know, uh, talk about all the entitlements, requirements, and so forth and so on. And then one of the things that, uh, you know, we're going to talk about with the jurisdiction is going to be, okay, so Mr. Duff is going to be, you know, investing in this neighborhood, and he is, you know, he's looking to develop this, this project that is going to benefit the city. So are there any incentive out there to be able to help Mr. Duff be able to bring this project to fruition? So that would be your uh, community development uh, grants that would be your your um, uh, CRAs uh, for the, tax uh, abatement yeah, from tax abatement yeah. and so forth. What are those incentives out there that are that are available? And then the next thing is okay, let's investigate um, on that property to see if it falls under a qualified census tract or if it falls on their opportunity zone, which also is going to bring incentive to. The developers. Well, and just hearing those particular steps, mm-hmm. a lot of developers don't even know that those programs exist. Right. I was going to say, you just taught a little master class there for a lot well, of Well, Well, and this is, again, why pairing up with the right firm and the right partner to know how to navigate it. Because I'll be honest, some of these programs... Uh, are not easy to understand. Right. No, absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. there's lots of paperwork, there's processes, there's approvals. You know, one thing that I just learned this week here in the city of Bell Fountain, um, they are wanting to see uh, developers to build new single fam- family home developments. So they have put in a 12 year, uh, t- a CRA for a 12 year tax abatement. Mm-hmm. So just think about that. If you buy and build, a new single family home in the city of Bell Fountain. Uh, for the 12 years after that, there is zero real estate taxes. Absolutely. Which on an average, wow. let's say yeah. two or three hundred thousand dollar home, that could be four to six thousand dollars plus a year. So if you take that math times twelve, that's almost a hundred thousand dollars if you're gonna own that property for that 12 years, which I didn't even know this program existed. Right. And and so now it's like, how do we help? If we want to solve the housing crisis, single family homes is one piece of that. It's not the total piece of that. No, but, but it is a very important part. You know, the American dream is very important. And we have to start with the premise that housing is a right for everybody across the board. It's a human right. Yeah. It's a human right. Yeah. And that's, we have to start from that premise. So... There's different options for the house, and you're going to have the buyers, and you're going to have the renters. You know, certain, buy, you know, for the buyers, American dream, they'd be able to, you know, get their families going, the young families and couples and so forth. Nowadays, in the current environment with the interest rates and so forth, it's becoming really, really hard for them to be able to to get into into that that dream. So, you you know, now you have a far wider amount of people when that pool that are renters. So you have to think about how can we produce um, housing that still be able to help their immediate needs as renters and perhaps for an extended period of time till they have enough um, to be able to put a down payment on a home and be able to you know, be able to buy that home. So yeah. R- Rolando, um, part of getting to know you and, and your story, um, is that American dream? And uh, tell us a little about growing up, because 
uh, America wasn't your home. Oh, I say uh, uh, an island of America was. So it, tell us about Puerto Rico. Well, yeah. by, by birth, I am, I am an American citizen yeah. uh, by birth. And any, any per, person born in Puerto Rico is. So mm-hmm. uh, that was back on, uh, you know, the Jones Law, back on the 20s when uh, they uh, extended the citizenship to uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, but, uh, you know, I grew up in, in San Juan, which is the metropolitan area, uh, highly dense uh, mm-hmm. urban area. Big tourist um, area, too. Very tourist areas. <laughs> and, but it's also San Juan is a city of contrast where you're going to be have people that they have and they have not. And one of the things that drove what a lot of people would come to San Juan and get out of the airport and start driving to old San Juan, uh, they're going to see, they're going to go through these uh, residential areas, which mm. is public housing. And so one of the things that we were talking earlier, one of the things that kind of clicked on me right off the bat was that why are these people enclosing to, you know, fenced in on these residential development, public housing. They all model to to address uh, affordable housing or at least to be able to provide homes to uh, people with lesser mean, yes. means. And they were high-density developments with no amenities. Um, they were block areas with hardly any architectural aesthetic elements. So it created a very stark environment and... Um, when you enclose people in an area, a housing area, you're telling them you're different and we are mm. enclosing you around mm. for X, Y reason. Yeah. And that, that gets into the psychic of the, of the residents. So uh, one of the things, that was one of the questions, why are we doing that? Why are we following those models? Um, but, you know, kind of, you know, sidebar uh, on that particular topic, but continue your question. You know, growing in Puerto Rico and uh, on Old San Juan, having, you know, lived through Old San Juan all my life, uh, you know, my, my, my youth and, you know, up to the time that I came here to the United States to get my education in here and then remain here in the United States. But um, Old San Juan is, is a great example of Spanish Renaissance mm. um, in the New World. You have examples of the second oldest church in the New World. Uh, so all of a sudden, those elements, you have, uh, you know, one of the great examples of military architecture. Uh, of, the, uh, is it the fort? Yeah, it's the fort yeah, in Morro yeah. and other, on other forts. So all those elements kind of contributed to really enjoy what architecture was all about and start learning more about it. The, his, the history and architecture is, is hand-in-hand with Puerto Rico and any, any, any country in the, in the world, so... So that's what really started, um, you know, tickle my my interest for architecture, and you know, you asked me, Rolando, why you got into affordable housing, and I also got from that end because you know I wanted to be able to to help and elevate people that need, you know, a dignified air, you know, place to live. Right? Yeah. We say, you know, safe. housing housing is yeah exactly safe and with dignity and um, that they can call home and feel safe. Um, and that was that was the rather important. Uh, you know, my mom, she uh, you know she was one of the pioneers of developing the Head Start program in Puerto Rico. Wow. Um, you know she. Uh, have uh, she was very involved in pedagogy you know that's where she got her her master's in pedagogy what is that i have that that's, that's pedagogy is the psych the psychology of teaching oh wow so mm. she was a, a teacher she was very involved pioneering the head start program and at times you know spending time with her on these neighborhoods that are you know of really you know needy people i mean level of poverty that you know hard to fathom and how engaged she was with that community to be able to elevate the level of education. So that that left a deep footprint uh, mm-hmm. in me. And, you know, all through my career, you know, I was lucky, uh, you know, right after I completed my studies um, at Ohio State that I was able to get with a firm that it was a small firm that we were doing affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of, you know, that kind of set the path, you know, 30-odd years. <laughs> Why what, the future. You mentioned Ohio State. What brought you to Ohio State specifically? Um, 
the football team. <laughs> ah. <laughs> really? That, that does it for a lot of people, actually. Yeah. You know, in Puerto Rico on uh, Christmas time and New Year's, you used to watch the, you know, all the balls. And yeah, time, of course. I think there were three balls, the cotton, the sugar, and the... Uh, and the orange, so Ohio State, you know, that was what yeah, yeah, is exactly. on the news. And Go like, Bucks. Wow, this is a great university. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know, rather shallow, but that's, that's the truth. No, I, I, <laughs> trust me, around here, it matters. Uh, Ohio State football is like a, an institution. So. Yeah. It's always that yeah. <laughs> I'm always that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As, a, as a, you know, educational center and a medical center, and uh, definitely uh, in the football, uh, college football map. Sure, absolutely. So the the other thing that's somewhat unique is a trivia. Uh, was the Knowlton School of Architecture, were you in that building, or had it been named after? No, it uh, was it, that, that came after. That came after. We, we were on Brown Hall, yeah, and okay. uh, later on was the annex, and uh, there's nothing like the Knowlton School. And, you know, I have to say that uh, the transition of the School of Architecture the history of the transition of school of architecture with Ohio State really is something to uh, uh, to be proud of, mm -hmm. from a program that came very close to uh, be eliminated because it's an expensive yeah. uh, it's an expensive program, to where the school is at is 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 it's an incredible you know um, thirty odd years have really turned out to be one of the best uh, schools in architecture in the state and the country. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that and love your DNA and history and you know here for our town. Uh, A.E. Knowlton and uh, the Knowlton Construction Company uh, here in Bell Fountain is where they were based. And uh, they built schools, colleges, universities kind of all throughout the Midwest. And then um, the company discontinued business in the 80s. But um, the Knowlton family, you know, is who's contributed the money uh, to 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 found this or, or to name the school uh, at Ohio State. And also that family has been very giving in terms of our library here at Buffon, the, the Knowlton Library. So mm. I just think that, uh, you know, I, I love people's stories and history and it's still a, a phenomenal program doing great things today. Yeah. It's very important to be able to, uh, you know, be philanthropic and give back to, uh, to the community with, uh, you know, iconic uh, School of Architecture or Iconic Library to be able to have the native. So a trivia know, fact, a lot of the buildings that are here in town, they would have leftover construction materials at times when they would do some of these projects. And it just happened to all get brought back here. So if you're on a walking tour, you'll see this beautiful glass block like on the back sides of some of our buildings. And you're like, why would they have used that premium building material well, it's because it was just extra stuff that was left over. So <laughs> I like to go on little architecture walking tours, and I usually get questions like, well, what's that? Well, that was used in a school in Chicago, but we got, you know, four feet by six feet and left that they got reused here in town. Well, so. yeah, might as well use it. Might as well. Yeah. That's right. An element. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your background and your journey into architecture and things like that. But in our previous conversation, you shared that you would call our current situation that we're in uh, a zoning crisis and, and not necessarily a housing crisis. Uh, why is that? Well, let's go back to the example that uh, that we were talking about with uh, with Jason, you know, yeah. this uh, hypothetical side that he wants to develop. Um, zoning, unfortunately, is being based on a zoning model that is from the 20s. And it actually was based... Uh, on a case that um, happened in Euclid, uh, Ohio, uh, Euclid, Ohio. That's yeah. what they call it, Euclidean uh, zoning. Mm. Um, and basically is by use. What is the use to set up the zoning? And that model probably was great when cities were starting to develop. But once you get to a critical point on a city that the city is highly developed, doesn't give you a lot of room all that to start sprawling around the city to be able to start to develop and that happened also all through the 70s you got all these sprawl, sprawling around the around the city uh actually starting on the 50s and the 60s the availability of of of, uh, of a car for everybody transportation mm -hmm. was easy and big cars uh, yeah you know? and you know the the arteries were starting to develop uh you know all the the Highways. The everywhere. highway systems uh, all the way around. So that kind of uh, also contributed to that. So here we are in 2024. And finally, the city of Columbus in the past few years was starting to develop the first amendment to the city zoning plan. And 
it was ratified and it's in place. So they were able to review and understand what are these obstacles. And obviously one of the major obstacles is going to be density. One of the big obstacles also is going to be parking. Because if you have a development right now and just say, the development that we were talking hypothetically for 100 units, and they just, just say that they're all one bedroom, so mm -hmm. the 100 units. So the code, any code in any city would tell you that more than likely you would need one-to-one -one relationship between parkings and units, okay? So obviously now we need to have a site that not only be able to serve the building, but also to self 100 parking spaces. Wow, yeah. And... When you drive through these facilities that are already in place and you look at the, the parking are usually about 60% full because not all the residents are going to be driving. A lot of the, a lot of the residents are going to depend on public transportation to be able to get them from home to, mm -hmm. to their uh, place of work. So um, that became a, a big issue. And, you know, I have to say I was very excited with the new, with new zoning uh, from Columbus because that opened a lot of doors. Density increased, the height of buildings increased. Right on, they have certain arteries, main arteries from the city of Columbus that they identified as critical. So this new zoning code is not citywide, but at least it extends within you know tributary areas of these main thoroughfares of the of the, of the city that would allow developers to be able to start providing housing either either you know market rate or affordable that can be within a bus route to minimize congestion with traffic because not not only you have to look at uh, public transportation for affordable housing but only on the market rate you want to be able to reduce the amount of uh, vehicular traffic in and out of the city uh, which is another of the problems that uh, that we have um, you know with any city so it, it is important that the uh, Every municipality understand their jurisdiction, understand if there's a change that has to be done on the zoning to be able to, to really kind of, I, I'm not going to use the word losing the requirements because that's not true, but to be able to review these, you know, these uh, regulations that have been in place for 100 years and start thinking about it in a little bit um, yeah to see if they're up to date uh, yeah a little bit more uh understanding of what the city and what the movement of the city what is the growth of the city sure uh you know bell fountain or or any secondary and tertiary county the uh city uh on logan county are looking for bringing um a new job so you know one of the main things when someone is going to invest into a municipality a city or or a county is to bring a new job it's like what is the availability of housing what is the ability of housing mm -hmm. for for my my workforce that i'm bringing into you know into these uh into this county or this town that i'm going to have you know my workforce is composed of of um you know administration and and vocational uh staff members mm -hmm. employees so you have to understand okay so bell fountain is it is it providing enough housing that my service oriented or, or administration side of, of of my company is going to be able to find housing and for my vocational side are they going to be able to find housing also proper housing and what is going to be the proximity of that housing within the when the limits to their job to right. their job and that that matters on an economic development level we've had this conversation with other people on the show but you know where they'll get they'll sign a, a huge company to come and provide lots of jobs which is very exciting but then you have the situation where all their employees are driving in every day to go to work and then they're turning around and driving right back out on to go home you know rather than coming dining eating shopping in 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 the, in the town right all right at this time we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors if you are looking for a dynamic workspace in the heart of Bell Fountain, look no further. Build Cowork and Space is your destination for creativity and collaboration. With state-of-the-art facilities and a thriving community, this is where innovation happens. Join them today for as low as $99 a month and build your success at Build Cowork and Space. Big City Dining in a Small Town. Now that's the syndicate. 
Join them for fresh steaks, pasta, or seafood for dinner, or stop in for Sunday brunch to experience one of their signature dishes such as chicken and waffles, and maybe even pair it with a mimosa flight. Located at 213 South Main Street in downtown Bell Fountain. Well, in the definition of affordability for housing, like Rolando shared with us earlier, is that 30% number has been the, the magic number. The problem is, is that we are uh, for, especially for the middle class or what is deemed the middle class, the affordability of that is, if that ratio is really creeping up a lot. Yeah. And, and in the cost of the housing continuum, there's other, there's other expenses like real estate taxes, uh, property and casualty insurance. It's not just your mortgage payment. Yeah. And so um, it, it's a national issue, but I, I, I do think by getting creative, and, and what Rolando is saying is example of Columbus, Ohio, they re- re-looked at their zoning code. And, and the cost to build a parking lot and maintain a parking lot is a lot of money. And if we can better utilize parking, and then the one piece, you, you, you know, public transportation, I appreciate mentioning that. The other piece is how do we make our towns and our neighborhoods more walkable? Like getting the access to the the amenities, yep. and, and I think for a lot of the downtown redevelopment, that's something that we really are trying to work with design professionals to make have the access to the types of things that residents need. And some early wins that we got here is when we got a twenty four hour fitness gym downtown. Mm-hmm. That was a place where people could work out, and then that's when the smoothie bar opened up, and the coffee shop opened up, and then some of the restaurants. And then when you start to get all those amenities, people want to live Absolutely. in that neighborhood. And then other investors, homeowners wanted to buy mm-hmm. closer to the neighborhood because of those things. Are you yeah, seeing you, that in other places no, too? Yeah. You started to create a, a critical mass. You know how you how you stabilize a, a neighborhood. You know there's there's different ways. You know you can start with the business side to uh, be able to have you know things that the residents would like to like to participate like you say you know the fitness center then you have the cafe then you have the the restaurant so forth and so on so you'll have those amenities you start thinking you know hey this 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 neighborhood is on, is on the you know is on the upswing all of a sudden it becomes a lot more attractive for uh, someone that is, you know, going to bring a factory or or a plant or or services office to an area that you know will be able to say, hey, this neighbor, this neighborhood is totally stabilized. You know, the first time that we met, you know, was about four years ago. Um, one of the things, is, and I share this with you, is you know, that really impressed me is the 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 level of encouragement that was happening on the city, how positive the the feel was walking around the town and so forth. And at that, you know, four years ago, uh, you were way on your way, but it's nothing like, you know, where I just realized right now, this yeah. building we're, we're at right now, that you know, different. four years ago <laughs> yeah, was, was just, bad. <laughs> you know, it, it, we walked this building. Yeah. So, the you city know, had it, to condemn the second, yeah, third, yeah, exactly. That was bad, yeah. But nevertheless, yeah. the building was a historical building, yeah. you know, on the on the opera district and, and, and an absolutely beautiful building that had a lot of possibility. And and, and it is great that, you know, a developer like you was able to, to check that, you know, to see that vision. And, okay, how can I take that vision into reality? And, you know, with a lot of, I can imagine a lot of, you know, bumps uh, on, oh, on the road and <laughs> yeah. learning uh, experience, you were able to, you know, to achieve what you want. And... That is the important, you know, we were talking about MA design and what we bring to the table and, you know, the, the importance to have the right professional to work with you through the through the process. And, you know, you have your professional that, that you were able to work in here and he did a great, you know, a great job. And, you know, for us and MA, that is very important that we cater to to the needs of our clients, to be able to listen to to the needs of our clients, like, you know, on the on the hypothetical project that that we have been you know presenting kind of using as an example that you know getting that one-on-one relationship and more most importantly to be able to sit down with you and get to a level of trust and that's very important for me to be able to have a high level of trust with my clients to understand that hey i am your representative i am you know going to guard your interest and we're going to work on these together so that to me is extremely important to to going particularly on 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 affordable housing projects uh to be able to get the kind of service necessary to be able to take the client from from the beginning to the end uh to the realization of the project and 
and beyond because mm -hmm. you know as an architect you are tied up to that building for perpetuity <laughs> yeah it, it's it's a it is a labor of love it's like a child like yes. you 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 inc it, 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 you create it and, and incubate it and help it grow um, I loved the the hypo uh, the hy hypothetical uh, hypothetical hypothetical thank you yeah. uh, situation you said earlier so let's just say we've been through the design phase we or we found a property we've designed a project we've started the conversation with the city uh, zoning and planning but we need a change because maybe the density of our project is is more than what the code says or maybe the zoning doesn't reflect the amount of people that are allowed on the property or the setbacks. I mean, there's a number of different sure. things. So we are going to have to go in front of a governing body mm -hmm. to ask for a change. And earlier, you mentioned, I think this is very true, because I probably have been in front of, when terms, in terms of board of zoning appeals <laughs> or planning commission, I maybe have done at least 50 meetings, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And my track record of approvals is maybe 60 to 70%. And, and probably... That's probably a good track record because yeah. um, in many cases, what Rolando was saying earlier, the people that show up are not the people that are probably representative of of, of wanting to see it happen. Mm -hmm. It's the people. Well, the growth. Yeah, yeah the growth the or the changes the or just, just the word change, I think, yeah. is hard for people. Especially in small towns, right? But it's they're the people that, that are against it. So I want to, you know, just let's just brainstorm here. For someone that may be going through this zoning change or this pre presentation in front of their city council or their board of zoning appeals, it could be a number of groups. Okay, um, what should you prepare for, and how should you, you know, the the neighbors? One of the first steps that I learned in this is all the uh, uh, the neighboring adjoining property owners get a notice that there will be a meeting and this project will be discussed and these are the changes that be proposed. Um, and then usually it's promoted on maybe the city's website. It might be in the local newspaper. So it gives the public an opportunity to show up to be heard, not only the person submitting the application, but for public comments on that particular project. What is your advice to kind of prepare for that meeting and some of the things that, that you should have ready for that night? You should prepare for everything and anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yeah. you don't know, uh, you know, any person that is in there have a reason why they are there. And given the opportunity to express their feelings, they will do that. And at times, um, they are legitimate concerns. All the ones are misnomers. Or all the times are just things that are really not related to the project. But in the big pictures, because they're there on the hearing, it means something to them. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you can, you have to take every question, you have to answer them with respect. Yes. And that is the most important thing when you are in the front of the neighborhood association or the municipality or the board of uh, zoning appeals or, or any any public meeting that is going to require and engage the community. It's extremely important. Uh, like I said earlier, you don't know what questions are going to come out. So you have to be totally prepared. You have to be transparent. It's extremely important that you are transparent and it's extremely important that you are fully truthful and, uh, you know, with full disclosure, mm -hmm. um, you know, at times there are things on a developer that, on the development that perhaps, um, you know, is, is not something that the neighborhood would like to hear, but you have to present and advise them why this is good for the neighborhood, even though it's something that perhaps they don't want to hear. Perhaps this building is going to, to you know, block uh, you know a historic uh, the billboard uh, of a historic building uh, of the 1800s where they used to have those beautiful artworks on the building, or um, you know perhaps uh, they're afraid of uh, the traffic impact that it's going to have. Uh, on these developments. So and yeah. sometimes there's just rumors that are factually not yeah. true. This is what I was yeah. going to jump in here. Uh, and so let's say you are getting pushback, whether it be from someone in the community or someone on the board. And you said that then you have to, it's in your responsibility to then educate, right? What are some some of the ways that you would advise maybe educating those people that are giving pushback in a respectful, professional well, way? The, the most important thing is to, you know, break uh, those misnomers, you know, yeah. to the understanding 
of uh, you know one of the on a you know, let's just say again we'll continue on the on the an example this hypothetical example so it's going to have 100 units so one of the things that they're going to say well you know that schools are going to get you know all these new students my you know the classes are going to be large that's a misnomer some of the studies that they have done clearly show that that is not the fact that in fact single family homes impact the classroom size far more than multifamily. Well, think about this. Yeah. So I just mentioned that I learned of the really amazing tax benefit, uh, uh, tax abatement mm -hmm. for new single family homes in Bell Fountain. Right. But I have not tried this and maybe we will try it someday. I would love to see that hundred unit apartment complex because we need more residential affordable housing but I guarantee you there's probably a good chance there'd be a lot more people come out to oppose that uh, versus the single family abatement. But to the point that you said, the facts don't line up that yeah. creating the problems with the schools. And that's where I think working with someone like you, let's let's like all the myths, let's bust them. Let's actually look at the data. Let's look at how this particular project impacts the neighborhood and then helps the whole overall city the whole overall county, the whole overall region. And it's interesting right now, there has been so much frustration and anger around new solar and wind. <laughs> and But the same could be true of landfills, yeah. manufacturing. Like if people would have banded together and said, we don't want the Honda plant. And there probably were people back then I'm pretty that, sure that did that. But, but there, is, there is proper ways to go about. Now what you want in hearing criticism is you listen, yeah, absolutely. and then you say, "How can we go back to the drawing board and listen to that feedback and adjust it so it has the least amount of impact to that particular audience or person?" Right? Yeah, you listen. You will listen to to their concerns, and you know some of the concerns I mentioned earlier. They are they are legitimate. So, you know, at that point, you know, uh, I would sit with you, you know, Jason, and say, "Hey, Jason, you know, perhaps we need to take a look at." you know, the aesthetics of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that the aesthetics is still, you know, pretty uh, contextual, but maybe, um, you know, maybe we need to, you know, look at a way, you know, architecturally that we can make the building look a little bit, a little bit shorter than what it is, even though it's still going to be three stories, let's just say three stories, uh, to be able to be contextual within the, you know, within the within the city. So uh, as architects and as, as uh your architect and you are our client it is extremely important for us to be able to listen to that and recommend you the best options that you will have mm. uh, and eventually we'll reach out to a project that once you know usually on this on this process it probably take one two or even three times to go through the through the different uh, boards that you have to uh, uh, present to be able to finalize a project that sure. uh, that might deviate slightly from the original vision, but nevertheless, you know, the, the ultimate uh, purpose of this project was to be able to bring 100 families to dignify housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and you know, the other thing I'll just mention, it, it is great to also be working with city staff probably, you know, a few months or maybe even longer before you go in Absolutely. front of these boards. Absolutely. Because the city staff are paid professionals. There's usually a city engineer or a city planning person. How do you mean working with them? Like like running the project by well, them? I love Orlando. Like, he said be transparent. So, mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear your advice, but you you go in and meet with them, right? You, what, you know, once, you know, the minute that you would say, Rolando, this is, okay, that's one of the first things I got to do. I got to go down and talk to the planning and zoning, the city engineer and so forth. This is what we're intending to do. You know, and, and this is, just with a with a sketch, paper right. sketch, yeah, and and basic, and so ba very basic, so we understand. I understand what are the possibilities from their end, and they will understand what are the possibilities from our end. And it's going to be a middle ground that we'll be able to meet, be able to to make that project go. Yeah, and because if they're on your side, absolutely, and but, going into the meeting, but they don't like yeah. surprises. So yeah. earlier, the earliest that you can meet with them on the project yeah all through the process uh they will be an ally they will be on your side because you know once you are on the on the front of the planning commission for approval 
A staff member is the one that's going to present your project. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So you want to ensure that you have gone all through the process with him because if he's happy, he's going to have a happy presentation. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't believe on your <laughs> You may have lost before you be a bad sales. Right? If yeah. he doesn't believe on your project <laughs> yeah. for X, Y, Z reason, you know, because you have not presented it correctly to him or you have, you know, kind of uh, we're, we're a little combative with mm -hmm. him, uh, he will not be able to present it. But but if he believes in the project and he understands what you're trying to do, he he's going to be your be biggest ally behind the scenes also, even before the project gets to the to the planning commission to uh, you know to get to get to their boats. Yeah. Dropping a lot of wisdom here today, Rolando. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, you, you, you live and learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I, I will share, you know, it is living and learning. My One of my first uh, losses in front of a board of zoning appeals, um, I'd worked so hard in this project. I, I was crying after the meeting because sure. I was that emotional that, like, how people could turn it down. But that will happen. Like, well, in absolutely. your career, that will happen. Mm -hmm. But it helps you relearn. And I think that, you know, the, the, the points that we've dropped today is knowing that there is a process, pairing up with a design professional to help you through that process, and then working through the channels to get the approvals and permits that you need to do it. And one of the things also that I have learned through my career is that at times after you have all these elements iron out, iron out and you're ready to present, you, you know, you're ready to vote, then all of a sudden there might be one hiccup. Mm that it was totally unexpected. Uh, and it happened to me, you know, uh, on a project. Um, it was an affordable uh, senior living project in um, New Albany, uh, Indiana, uh, just across Louisville. And we went all through the process. We have, you know, we did everything exactly that we are advising on the protocol and everything was clear. Uh, by law, you have to do a title search on this property. You know, the hypothecary, you have to do a title search. Sure. By law, you have to go back 50 years, right? So understand the whole history of the, you know, of the site, make sure that uh, everything is A-OK -okay for that particular property. And we thought that we were right, you know, we were right there. You know, we we had uh, that night that we went in, we made our final presentation, there were two people in the audience. The first one... Uh, just after we uh, finish and just before the the commissioners are going to vote, they usually open for the open mic for the people attending. One person came in, they were all for the project, and then all of a sudden a very quiet gentleman uh, get up and say, you cannot build that project. And he's like, uh, why, why not? Yeah. Because there's half an acre of that property that I own. Oh, wow. And that mm. didn't come out in the title search. Yep. So all of a sudden now, what are we going to do? There's a wrinkle. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? And eventually, a uh, conversation with the client and uh, uh, the property owner, we were able to come to an agreement. And, um, you know, he got iron out. You know, everything got iron out. We got the project. Project's built. It's mm -hmm. been, you know, very successful. But that shows you that there's always something no matter how much you try to be diligent, and we all are extremely diligent on our process, we have to, uh, there still might be something that might come up that is totally unexpected. Yeah, and, and I think that's another reason why we need to encourage more people to take risk and developers to, to do this work because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And those little wrinkles, I have had a number of them, whether... It's an environmental issue that was underground that we weren't aware of, or something weird. Title issues tend to pop up. Um, there's just these 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 things, and that slows it down. It raises the the cost and the time of in it. But at the end of the day, we've got to find a way to reduce these barriers and 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 find creative ways to add more housing. Absolutely. So if, if we can take the episode a little bit from the design perspective of what you're seeing to be creative, to lower the cost of housing and construction. Is there any any kind of innovative things that you, you're excited about that for maybe developers or property owners that might be listening or even cities that might be listening that, that you're kind of excited about as how housing innovations? 
Well, one of the one of the big ones go back to the zoning. You know, uh, getting away from you know to the traditional zoning and going to form based zoning. Which, and just can you give a cliff notes like what is the what is a, a, a form based zoning is basically an area that you're going to develop that is going to be a mixed use. That's multiple things can happen. Uh, on multiple mm-hmm. things. It's not driven by the use, but it's driven by the form. Okay, so you're going to have certain amount of scales of buildings that are going to be more into the business side. You're going to have intermediate buildings that are going to be mostly for uh, retail and residential. And then you're going to have even smaller scale buildings where it's going to be for a single family. So um, a lot of people think that form based uh, zoning is kind of more looser than the traditional, but it's not because you have to have. The restriction of that form to keep that form, to get those open spaces, the percentage of open spaces you're going to need to have gathering spaces within the community, your landscaping, so forth and so on. How are you going to handle parking? If you're going to handle parking, you know, on a on a vertical slab, how are you going to treat that to be able to be within the aesthetic elements mm-hmm. that you are designing that form base? So, there's a number of the de- developments um, uh, in Columbus that, that are extremely well done on their, their form base. And, you know, one of the great examples, if you ever come down to Columbus, come to our office at MA, um, on the areas called the yard, you'll see that that is a great example of how a, a great urbanism and great design for form base can really enhance the, you know, the environment and the surroundings of a particular neighborhood. And remind me, your neighborhood, where is your office at? It's in um, uh, Grandview area, Grandview, on the yep. yard. Yep. Uh, is it called Grandview Yard now? Is that no, the name? No, 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 it's just Grandview. You're the yard. Okay, yeah, yes. We are the yard. Got and, it. Okay, yes. got it. I've and, heard uh, that kind of mm-hmm. used. So. This particular area was to be kind of an industrial site yeah. um, on the short uh, west end of the city and uh, i think it has some distribution centers that were some manufacturing and so forth and it's been totally transformed mm-hmm. it's been totally transformed with uh, a beautiful transition between the city you know the city of, of grandview uh the single family homes they're very traditional uh the neighborhood was built um you know somewhere between the 1920s and the 1940s maybe a little bit earlier than that um very proud neighborhood and how these new development have been able to really interact and and weave in within that fabric love that another reason to take a trip right yeah yeah well uh i appreciate we've talked a little bit about you know incentivizing developers to, to build and things like that and i would just want to share to our audience that rolando has provided some materials on low income tax credits um, that I will link in the show notes in the video description if you'd like to, to click on that and learn more. Um, and then another episode on the podcast, I believe we uh, talked with uh, um, Monticello Homes on, on a previous episode, uh, Home Building in a Housing Crisis. I thought that was a pretty interesting episode. We talked a little bit more about some of these housing credits. So if you're looking to get into that space, um, just a few resources, I think, to point you to. Another episode, I know we mentioned the neighborhood in Columbus, but we had Kenny McDonald on from mm-hmm. uh, the Columbus Partnership and One Columbus, just kind of highlighting yeah. all of the growth that's happening in Columbus and changes in various neighborhoods and stuff. But it's yeah. another great episode that ties to this one, but particularly what's happening in the Columbus region. Yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good example and there. I, I'm a big fan of the podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you. Know. Thank yeah. you. So, yeah. Appreciate that. Um, it's pretty awesome, you know, uh, and, and kind of expanding on reference to some of the materials that would help people. Also, I have, uh, you know, a number of blogs that, um, you know, the audience can be able to uh, go to. Sure. And, yeah. And, uh, Where and would really, they find those at? They'll be able to find those at the MA Design uh, website. Okay, great. And, and, you know, the thing about today is we could probably have four episodes right. on affordable yeah. housing, but the biggest thing is just getting started. Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, identify the sites, work through finding the right design professional, start partnering up with your city to get that, um, you know, those incentives in line, and then the capital stack. So mm-hmm. the things that's in the show notes that we're putting – all of those programs and incentives that Rolando mentioned, um, look into those because that then will help get that approval from your bank. Then you've got the capital lined up. And then let's get this, you know, these, these zoning with the form based zoning aligned to, to start to see 
um, new construction and then renovation happening in these old buildings. Some of them are office buildings mm -hmm. that are being converted to residential, but it's got to start with everything that he's mentioned already on the show. Yeah. Um, and just appreciate both of you just kind of unpacking some of this as, you know, you both have a wealth of knowledge and uh, for those looking to get started, you know, I feel like a lot of people just assume that they know the the processes and stuff. So I know some of the stuff may feel a little elementary at times, but I appreciate you like laying the groundwork out there for, for a lot of people. And I hope listeners, if you are considering, you know, getting into developing or you have a project in mind that... Um, this at least gives you a starting point, but absolutely, I'm going to move us into a new show or not a new show segment, but <laughs> one of our show segments, rapid fire Q and a, okay, here we go. <laughs> These are the uh, tough questions. Just a couple tough questions here for you. Uh, the first one is, are you a Coke or a Pepsi guy? Coca-Cola. Yes, okay. let's go. <laughs> That's kind of a South thing. A lot of people yeah. that have that South connection. Yeah. So yeah, it's good. I, I'm with you there. Um, so the next question I have for you is how do you rest and recharge? Maybe what is what is your favorite place to vacation? Um, well, my favorite place to vacation is going home to Puerto Rico and yeah. relax. Uh, going to the area of Cabo Rojo, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, beautiful areas in, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, makes you feel at home with your, with your families and, you know, everybody from your country. Uh, beautiful to relax. Uh, my partner and I, we just came from vacation uh, from Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, uh, first time for her and she absolutely uh, enjoyed it. And yeah. how, how I relax, I, you know, like to, uh, you know, go home and after, uh, you know, uh, Hard day at work, uh, you know, pick up uh, an instrument and play for a little bit and, and relax. All right. Play music for a little bit and relax. And yeah. multiple instruments, by the way. Tell me again how many uh, you like the, to... As a precaution, this is yeah. my, my instrument would be hand percussion or stick percussion, drumming, piano, and uh, the guitar recently, which I... Uh, it really is taking all my attention. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Well, if you feel like writing us a new theme song for the Small Nation podcast, just yes. reach out. I'd be, I'd be more than glad to. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love just, that. Just a little anecdote. As uh -huh. I was a kid, I was taking the guitar lessons. I was the first instrument that, that um, you know, I started studying. And I, at a very short time, I realized, man, this is not my instrument. So I'd rather take the guitar, flip it around, and play it on the other side. <laughs> That's how you become a percussionist. <laughs> That's how you become a percussionist. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. All right. I love that. Um, and as someone who has spent a lot of time in the Columbus area, what is your favorite restaurant to eat mm. at in Columbus? Well, it depends if we're going to do casual dining or we're going to do formal dining. If I'm going to do formal dining, I would go down to the avenue. Yeah. Uh, really yeah. yeah. And if I'm going to do casual dining, this depends what I would like to, you know, what I would be. You know, for if I'm gonna go uh, for pizza, I go to Italian. I go to Figlio's, or um, you know, if I want uh, good Indian food, I would get you know ethnic food. I would go to uh, Abbott, which is a great uh, Indian. I've heard uh, of it, not been. Yeah. yeah, it's right on Grandview. So okay. the you know the Grandview area in in Columbus have really grown extremely with some great. Uh, culinary choices yeah yeah no it's it's been kind of uh, popping off here in the past several years so a lot of lot of lot to do out there um i still have not been to the avenue yet but i i, I really put it on go. your list yeah um all right a couple closing questions for you here and one is what is one professional development resource that was impactful for you along your professional journey wow that's an interesting question so i would have to say that uh, there have been a number of architects all through my uh career that really had a, a deep uh, footprint and impact on all my development. Um, you know, one, uh, one of them uh, uh, was George Berardi, another one uh, was uh, Kurt Moody, uh, you know, rest in peace. He just passed away. He just passed away. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, so uh, uh, they're, they're both, uh, you know, forces of nature on – what they were doing, and uh, you know, uh, locally George Berardi still alive, and but you know, uh, our condolences to the to yes. the Moody family. Yeah, yeah great ones, um, good mentorship there. If someone were listening today and they wanted to uh, to learn more about you and your business, uh, where would they go? They would go to our website and uh, be able to check on the team members and uh, be able to click and. Uh, uh, if you're interested in um, uh, more information on affordable housing, you you know click on uh, 
my uh, icon and uh, we'll be more than glad to set up a, a meeting and you know come or come down and meet you and uh, start talking uh, about your vision and see how we can uh, get you there yeah awesome a great website by the way i was checking it out before the show and a lot of good stuff on there so i highly recommend listeners to check it out we oftentimes talk that we need dreamers and doers and what i appreciate about architects and and folks that are in that design mindset is they're thinking a hundred years from now like what is it that we can plan build or design that's going to benefit the next generation and uh, i i think today a lot of the ideas about affordable housing we know that it's a a short-term problem but it's a short-term problem that has if we work on it and we can be creative about it and fix it has long-term implica- implications. Absolutely. If you if you think about it, you know, I don't know how much time we have, but I, you know, yeah. just just that's a great that's a yeah. great uh, topic that you brought because the history of of affordable, affordable housing started with public housing back in the 1920s where they started building all these labs and silos, uh, you know, the Cabrini Greens development out in Chicago so forth and so on. And those are they were experiments that were not executed correctly and they didn't work. Okay, so learn from those, you know, from those mistakes that you, what you see on on affordable housing today, you see a development that, you know, perhaps might have 240 units, no more than that. But within that context of 240 units, you are providing service for for the residents. If it's an affordable housing project, you are providing services to be able to improve their life skills, to monitor their health have places to be able to, for their fitness, you know, again, on their health, be able to have an area that uh, be able to have a, la- a life counselor for them. So all these de- developers that are developing affordable housing, they're not only thinking about providing, you know, the adequate housing and dignified housing, but they're also trying to provide tools to be able for the residents to be able to move through that run mm-hmm. and, you know, be able to get that education, which I, to me, is is as important as providing the housing. Yeah, itself. it's missional, right? Yeah, it's missional, exactly. Mm-hmm. Let's keep on that mission and let's keep creating good. Thank you, Rolando. Absolutely, for appreciate it. Again. Appreciate yeah. it. Much obliged. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in on this episode of the Small Nation Podcast. We hope that conversation proved valuable to you. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to share the episode and follow the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting platform. You can also subscribe to the Small Nation YouTube channel if you prefer to watch your episodes. Follow Small Nation on social media, and we'll see you in the next episode.